Okay, so hopefully that is the last of that. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties here. Um, but um, so this is 212. Um, I'm uh, Ted Pavlik. And so mainly today, I just want to go over a couple of the course policies and then uh, briefly kind of introduce uh, the course. This is a really weird uh, room. Um, this is um, Normally, when I teach this in this building, it's downstairs where the computers are facing the wall. So a little strange, the, the, the kind of perpendicular thing, but people probably just get used to it. Um, so this is a course about dynamics, about dynamic processes. So uh, this is used to be called uh, like calculus two for sustainability, but wanted to change kind of the focus of the course. So um, when you've, you've all taken a calculus one course, either in sustainability or for those of you who aren't sustainability majors outside of sustainability, you've learned a little bit about differentiation, about integration, things like that. Um, and those are the mathematics that help describe how things change over time. In this course, we are trying to make it so that we can take the principles that you've learned in those, um, those courses and instead of having to write out all of the math, we just write out basic relationships between some of the indices that really come out to just basic arithmetic. And, um, and then we enter that into a computer, which effectively builds these equations for us and ends up doing the integration for us. So whereas in a calculus one course, uh, you'd start with uh, sort of the equation and you'd figure out how to find a solution. This course is a lot more about building the equations and using a computer to find that solution. And so um, we, in this course, are going to be using a lot of systems things. So how many people have taken SOS 220? So you'll see a lot of overlap with 220. 220 is a systems thinking course, whereas 220 doesn't go into as many of the quantitative schools, does focus on things like feedback loops and so on. So that's what we're gonna really be focusing on this course is given known sets of interdependencies among variables and sustainability problems, then um, can we use our knowledge about those to build simple expressions, not complicated kind of calculus expressions, but simple expressions that capture those interdependencies and then allow a computer to unroll them so that we can see, given these amount of interdependencies in a system, can we make quantitative predictions about how that system might behave over time? So that's kind of what we're doing here, is using the computer-based tool to do the math for us. That's what really this course is all about. So we changed the name to System Dynamics and Sustainability. It's not really a calculus course. It's a course about learning how to take dynamics and build them into these systems. So um, there's a nice example from uh, Gene Bellinger here, um, sort of scared to try this um, in this classroom, but let me see if I can manage to get this working. I figure out which side good okay it's that side so like if you were to all these slides which are now and i'll talk about the course organization stuff um and so um we'll um all of these slides are available on the canvas page just before class i published the canvas page this is and i'll mention this a little bit later too may but um this is the, like i said the first time we've taught the i taught this course in the uh fall i normally teach it in the spring and so it turns out that, um, for one thing, there's one less lecture in the spring, uh, you know, spring, uh, or sorry, one less lecture in the fall, fall starts on a Thursday, spring starts on a Tuesday. So it's been kind of a headache getting the assignments to line back up. And that's why um, I took a while to publish the Canvas page. And I'm still um, working on uh, realigning some of the assignments because some of the assignments aren't published yet, but most of the main content is there on Canvas and all of the lectures are on Canvas. So, um, so this will be up there as well, and you can click on that link if you'd like, um, you know, if you'd like to run through this example. But this is kind of an example of a predator prey system that's modeled in this tool called Insight Matrix. So we're going to be the two big tools that we'll be introducing 
this semester, our tool called FinSim. It's a tool that is going to be available on all of these computers. You can also download it for yourself. It works for both Mac and for Windows. It's a tool that's used in industry. Um, and then there's this Insight Maker, which mimics a tool used in industry called Stella, uh, but is meant to be kind of an educational tool. And it compl runs completely in a web browser. So you can create a free account in Insight Maker, and then you can go and build these, uh, these models and simulate them all within a web browser. And they both do very similar things. The only reason I teach both of them is um, some students like one better than the other. Some students have more technical challenges with one than another. Um, if you end up liking one, you can kind of forget about the other one. So none of the exams that I'm going to give here or, or any of the things are going to be talking about specifics of one or the other. They'll talk about generic things that could be answered with either. But I want to make sure you have a tool that you're comfortable with. So we have both of them. So this is Insight Maker. And, um, and so this is kind of an example that, again, so that, uh, that Bellinger has kind of a canned example of what the, the sort of things that we, you, we will end up doing in this class. And so the um, idea here, and I'm just going to sort of narrate this myself, is if you were wondering about uh, trying to explain the uh, dynamics of a predator-prey system, like this moose and wolf system, and so you have to say, well, there's a lot of things going on there. For one, we know that um, there's probably some growth process going on with both the moose and the wolf. And so if I just build um, a moose uh, model here, then we're going to learn how to build these models. So I'm not expecting you to already uh, know how to read these things. But, um, but basically, if you were to think back to calculus, um, anything that is a box is like a variable. And when it has a line going into it, that suggests a differential equation with respect to that variable in time. So this is basically saying that if you remember back to ASU 101 or uh, for a calculus class, this is sort of saying that d moose dt is equal to some birth rate times the number of moose minus some death rate times the number of moose. So we'll eventually again learn how to read these things, but we're just showing uh, graphically what we used to write in an equation form. And so this, you know, we know very simply that there is some birth rate. So every moose, uh, for every moose, it produces on average maybe one offspring per year or whatever. We put that as a birth rate. We also know that moose live for an average of so many years. We can do one over that, and that gives us the death rate. And we have just a simple model for a moose population. And we can put that into a tool like this. And if you were to do that, you can simulate it, and um, and you end up getting curves that look like this. So if you can't see these things, basically these are the blue line here is uh, the number of the moose populations, the orange is the number of moose births, and the green are the number of moose deaths. And so not really that surprising, this looks like an exponential growth curve. It's so basically saying that if all you have a population is moose, and there's nothing limiting their growth, then they grow to the sky. They grow forever. So that's not, you know, that doesn't really capture reality there. So we might then say, well, what more can we do to complexify this model? Well, we need a wolf population too. So we can put a wolf population in here, same sort of idea. Um, you know, this is the number of wolves, the wolves DT, it's got a wolf birth rate, wolf death rate. And with those sort of things, we can also simulate um, a, um, a, a wolf population that in this case, because the death rate is higher than the birth rate, you start out with an initial number of wolves, that's the green line, and it decays asymptotically to zero. So these curves, if we were to write the mathematical equivalent of that diagram, you could, using stuff you learned in count one, solve for something that if you plotted it, would be this green line. We didn't have to do that. We had to sort of write it in, hit go, and it plots it for us. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. So we're seeing now that we've got, if you leave moose alone, they grow to the sky. If you leave wolves alone, they plummet into the ground. And so neither of those seem very realistic. And so the, you know, the kind of systems thinking idea is, well, what if I move forward and I start coupling these things together? And now I see that when there's a lot of moose, basically I'm going to have that have an impact on the birth rate. So in other words, if there's a bunch of food around, then wolves will be able to have more wolf babies. And, um, and then likewise, there's going to be a coupling into the uh, death rate of the moose um, from the wolves. And so we'll learn how to write the math behind this all. But this basically, this kind of 
almost a systems diagram like you learned in 220 links these two together where it'll say if you have more wolves, you're going to have a higher death rate of moose. So now we've created a feedback. So we have these two systems that independently would grow to the sky or plummet to the ground. And if we were to then simulate these two coupled systems together, then we get some interesting dynamics that maybe were not things that we anticipated ahead of time. So now we're seeing the green line as wolves, the blue line as, as moose, the rest of these lines are their birth rates and death rates. But if I just focus on the populations here, then we see that there's this kind of oscillating characteristic where one is leading the other one. So if the, uh, as I get a peak in wolves, uh, well, if I get a peak in moose, a little bit later, I get a peak in wolves. But as the wolves start growing, the moose start dying. And as I get fewer moose, then eventually I get a trough in wolves. And these things kind of go back and forth. And so this, I'm not saying, is necessarily the most realistic trajectory for a, uh, for a predator prey population. But this, in theory, is a non-trivial trajectory you could get out of predator prey as they kind of go back and forth. And it turns out that there are a few systems that you can find in nature that do have this oscillation. So you go into a, a, a particular lake in Africa, for example, and you sample the number of fish. And sometimes you have a huge number of one fish and not many of the other. And then at other times it's the reverse. And if you keep coming back, it keeps switching back and forth. And without this theoretical lens, then we don't really have a way to make sense of that. But seeing that if you couple these things together, it can generate these sorts of oscillations, helps us generate new hypotheses that we then can test in the real system. So that's kind of what we're trying to do in this class, is get us to the point where we can build these hypothetical models. So that's my uh, kind of wolf and moose example. So let me just head back to um, here. Um, and so, you know, there's also um, other sorts of examples. It's kind of more like uh, 220, where um, this is this kind of this cute example with the, uh, the bird feeder. And for those of you who've taken 220, then you've probably seen plenty of examples that look like this. But, uh, but this is kind of a nice, for those who, uh, who haven't taken a systems thinking course, this is, I think, was, I think a nice example where it's going to be hard to read here. And so I'll just kind of illustrate that there's a little box up here that says birds outside of breakfast creates a pleasant morning. So this is something that um, we know individually. This is, uh, this is always true. This is generally true. I see birds outside for this type of person, it makes their morning more pleasant. So that's a simple thing that we don't have to challenge. Um, and the, but we then also notice that if I have a pleasant morning, that encourages me to make a bird feeder. So because, you know, if I, then I think, oh, this is kind of fun looking at these birds. I'm going to put a bird feeder out there. So that if I keep going down this path, then I see that if I put a bird feeder out there, that's going to increase the birds at feeder, which um, my intended out, uh, outlook would be would be to improve my pleasant morning, this thing here. So I'm starting to see a positive feedback file. Like a growth, like the moose growth there. Now, the thing is, if you keep doing this, then it also does it increases the attractiveness of the garden, which might also has a positive feedback. Um, the attractiveness of the garden might even attract even more birds. So all good, all good after that. But the thing is, um, and then it also detracts a pleasant morning, reduces frustration. And if you reduce frustration, that's going to further increase the pleasant morning. So again, this looks like it's a more and more complicated tale of all good things. But if I keep going here, then um, I find that the number of birds at feeder increases the needs to buy bird seed. And with increased need to buy bird seed, I have increased frustration. So now the same thing that over here was looking like was all good, apparently has something putting it in check where eventually the need to buy bird seed might take away from the pleasant morning. On top of that, it increases spillage, which increases the need to buy that seed, but also spillage is going to attract squirrels. And those squirrels are going to chase away the birds, which is going to decrease um, you know, those of the feeder and so on and so forth. And so you keep going down here, and what we see is taking a systems perspective allows us to assemble tiny relationships that are incontrovertible. Like we know that seeing more birds in the feeder is going to make you 
have to, or make this person have to. Um, and so if we take a narrow view, then it might suggest one course of action. Get a bird feeder, um, buy a doll, um, buy a cat, uh, have children, you know, all of these sorts of things that seem like, you know, an immediate way to increase the joy in your life. But when you zoom out a little bit, you find out that there's all these side effects. And that taking this systems perspective means that the optimal choice is probably somewhere in between the two crazy alternatives you have of maybe no bird feeder and bird feeder or whatever it may be. And so in order for us to make informed decisions, we need to zoom out. And um, into the tools that we'll use in this class, build on, this is basically SOS 220. SOS 220 is all about, um, if I take these little individual links and put them together, what sort of feedback might be there? Then we're taking this and we then turn it into the diagram like I showed you on the previous one, where we can actually um, animate it over time. And so not only do we recognize that there are feedbacks there, but we then even use quantitative predictions to help us figure out what the right solution might be. And if let's say temperature changes and climate change or whatever, how that right solution might shift in a quantitative way with the changes in the environment. So those are things that we sort of learn how to do in this class. All right, so any questions about those two examples? That be clear motivation for what we're trying to do. And coming into this class, I'm not expecting, uh, you won't be solving again much calculus. You wanna occasionally be able to recognize a differential equation, but you won't have to solve one. I'm not expecting you to have any background in computational modeling or simulation or tools that you learn in this class. So a little bit of arithmetic, a little bit of willingness to look at some graphs and think about graphs critically. Um, and then otherwise we'll, we'll learn the rest in this class. So it's my claim that, so if you look at our uh, School of Sustainability website, there are these things called core sustainability competencies. And there's five of them, systems thinking, future thinking, value thinking, strategic thinking, and collaborative competencies. And um, these are the ways in which somebody asks, what is sustainability? Well, the experts say that if we want to come up with a real objective definition of what sustainability is, we can break it down into these five things. So a sustainability scientist is equipped with tools that allow that, uh, that, that scientist to, um, to work along these dimensions. And it's my claim that um, in this class, with the modeling tools we picked up, that we hit four out of five. So we're going to be um, thinking about systems that kind of already motivated. We're going to be thinking about um, making, uh, you know, in trying to incorporate future outcomes into current decisions. We're going to think about strategies for making future outcomes kind of come true. And then this collaborative competency, what a lot of people don't realize here, and but I hope that you can start seeing this, going from differential equations to computer simulations is actually really improved your ability to communicate. Being able to show someone a graph, being able to walk someone through a narrative is going to help you make an argument far better than showing them some equations. And that's another skill that we're going to be trying to use here. And then on top of that, when you work in groups together, having a tangible transitional object, a boundary object that allows everyone to sort of interact with it is makes it much easier to pour your ideas into and have them being properly interpreted by someone else and then have you get that feedback from someone else without having to worry about the ambiguity of words. So um, the quantitative tools we have here are not only meant to help us make predictions, but are also help, meant to make us um, better communicators of sustainability problems. All right, so any questions? All right, so this gives me an opportunity to introduce these things. So when I, I have these classroom things, I will periodically um, have these slides pop up. Now, um, I'll mention um, about you know, modalities here in a second, but Basically, if you ever have a question and you don't um, want to you know, attach your name or your identity to it, um, you're free either here in class or with your cell phone or, or whatever um, to uh, go to this URL or to go to that QR code and submit an anonymous question. And I will, uh, when I'm not as frazzled as I was coming in uh, here today, um, try to monitor them during class. If I don't get to your question during class, then I'll try to answer it on Canvas or on Slack. Um, after class, 
um, once I see this. So it's an opportunity to ask these sort of anonymous questions. And I'll also mention here in a second that um, that I do support uh, in this class kind of a sync modality. So on Metal to Canvas's page is up. If uh, you would like to participate in the class remotely uh, or asynchronously, um, then there are options for that. And this still allows you to interact with me. Of course, if you're, if you're um, linking in synchronously, there are other ways you can get my attention through the Zoom chat, things like that. But if you are, um, still want to be anonymous or if you're asynchronous and just want to put a question in the queue that you don't want to maybe post on the discussion boards, then this is a way to do it. Okay. So I have a question. Yeah. Why is it more of a class? Um, well, so the last one here, value thinking, is, um, is an important competency, but I don't think that in this course, the scope of this 200 level modeling course to really get into that kind of the values components. Um, I, there will be opportunities for that. There's a project in this course. And so I think that um, you know, students will have an opportunity to because couple that in. But at, generally speaking, um, the content of this course really sticks more to the modeling and less to uh, maybe, you know, like how modeling might affect different groups differently or how different groups might use modeling. So it's just not kind of a core feature of the course, but I definitely think more advanced uses of modeling um, could start to blend in. Does that answer your question? Is that plausible? No, it makes sense. But ultimately, it sounds like it's just a couple of the plot values in as uh, uh, elements of the simulation. Right. Well, it's, I mean, this is like I said, this was originally in Calc 2 for sustainability. And um, and so it's a 200 level course. So a lot of a lot of students, because it's not a prereq for other courses, take it late in the career. But it's designed for potentially, you know, the second year students in sustainability. And we're sort of building from basic foundations, just trying to build up to the kind of quantitative tools. And we kind of run out of runway, sort of, to do everything. But um, I do think there are sort of like 500 level courses, for example, that we do in dynamical systems modeling that really I think can get into coupling in. Um, how to complement thinking about uh, the subjective aspects of society um, with um, these sort of quantitative aspects too. So I think that that's, that's there's, I, I don't want to say this can't be, quantitative modeling can't contribute to all five, but this course is a limited scope. Okay, great question. Any other questions? Okay, great. All right, so um, administrative stuff. Uh, so Canvas is now um, pushed, uh, published here. Um, so this is the screenshot from spring 2021. So, but it's basically a similar layout. Um, and uh, so the way on the home page of Canvas here, if again, you're interested in attending remotely, um, there's a direct link to uh, the Zoom that uh, can get you in live, as well as a link to the recorded uh, classroom recording from the semester if you want to watch asynchronously. Um, so synchronous, asynchronous. And the office hours information um, are here. And so um, I'll be posting Zoom office hours. Um, my office is way over in the brickyard, which is sort of probably far from most of you. And so I've just been making use of the Zoom um, office hours and usually it helps people share a screen and things like that. But if for some reason you do need to meet in person, we can make that happen as well. Um, their TA is back in the corner. Um, and so uh, he will also have some office hours available. Um, he'll be doing a lot of the grading as well. So if you have questions about grades and things like that, then and he'll, his contact info will be up on this page uh, here. He's just got access to the site just as you guys did. So I haven't had a chance to update that just yet. So, um, so those are two ways to get in contact with us. Um, there are a number of different other ways to connect with each other and to connect with us. So like I said, there's discussions, there's Slack. You can feel free to, free to direct message me. A lot of students feel uh, like, oh, I can do that. Um, instead of email, that's totally fine. Um, I've got this people link here where you can find others that are in the class, which will be useful as we start talking about final projects. So feel free to make use of those tools. Now, the big thing, most of the most of what you'll find in Canvas for this course is going to be under modules. Uh, you can find it other ways, but I've tried to organize it so you can kind of leave it inside modules. 
And because there's so much there, what I'd recommend you do is when you go into the campus to hit uh, in module, get your collapse all, just smash that button first to collapse all of these individual modules down into this here. Because um, again, it, when they're all expanded, it just looks like a lot. But the way they're organized is up at the top, we've got um, this module here. If you expand that down, that's where you can find the syllabus. You can find information about how to get to the software we've talked about, VinSim and so on. Um, you can find um, Insight Maker as well. You can find a tentative schedule for classroom activities and so on and so forth. Um, for if you want to get access to the asynchronous recordings from this semester and previous semesters, you can go into this classroom recordings module. Um, and then um, the thing that we we'll have to worry about kind of the most immediate thing here is there is kind of a syllabus quiz that is built into this unit zero module. So if you open that unit zero module, you'll find there's basically one thing in there, and that's the kind of syllabus quiz. And you have to complete that to get access to all the other modules in the course. So um, that is, I think, you know, due this Sunday, but um, you, know, you can complete it as many times as you want. You have to score a perfect score on it. If you uh, happen to you know, do it a little bit late, I'm not going to take any points off for it, uh, but, uh, but I just am putting it in there as a goal to have it done by Sunday. And it's just a syllabus quiz. And once you've done that, it'll open up all the rest of these things. So the way the rest of this is organized is basically I've had some students like to have all the assignment types in one place. Other students like to have things sort of interdigitated um, in a kind of chronological order. So I've done both of those things. And so some of you will hang out at the top of the modules and some of you will hang out at the bottom of the modules. So up here at the top, um, the sort of four uh, major assignment groups here, money is, which I'll talk about here in a second, money is points, reading, homework assignments, in the final project have all been clustered together by that assignment type. So you can find them all out here, um, but they also will be um, peppered in down here. So at the bottom of the module, I've got all of the units. So unit A, introduction to simulation, unit B, cobble and diagrams. If you expand those out, you'll find that it'll have lectures, homeworks, et cetera, um, all sort of in chronological order the way they're presented. So if you like to think kind of sequentially through the course, down here, if you'd rather think in terms of uh, what type, like I need to get to the next homework assignment up here. So it looks like a lot, but again, I just encourage you to hit that collapse button first, and then hopefully this will end up being relatively easy to navigate after that. Um, like I said, uh, the, some of these assignments, I still am working on moving around to get them lined up with the spring schedule. So like if you go into, I think probably the homework assignments will look like anything published right now, but hopefully in, uh, tonight or tomorrow, I'll have all that worked out so that all these will be populated and you can even start working on them ahead of time if you'd like. They're all going to have due dates. And so the Canvas calendar, as well as the course summary at the bottom of the home page, you click on home and down the very bottom of it, all should be uh, you know, ordered up by those due dates. And so you want to know what's due next, you can trust Canvas, so the due dates should be in there, at least after I get things all sorted out again after this uh, shift um, from fall to spring, or spring to fall. All right, so uh, any questions about this organization here? Pretty simple sort of stuff. Um, do, you have, do you have any trouble finding anything? And everything should be on Canvas, um, so but just let me know. Feel free to contact me however you like. Uh, if you do need to email me, speaking of contact, uh, so then you, know, you get a lot of like other emails, uh, people wanting to sell me stuff for my lab and things like that. Um, I, so I highly encourage you to put SOS212 in the subject, um, just so your email can get flagged and so I can get back to you as soon as possible and it doesn't get missed or put in the spam or whatever. Or like I said, you can contact me with one of the other modalities, Slack, et cetera, if you prefer. Um, if you do have a question about graded work, um, then uh, I uh, encourage you to, um, because um, Jorge will be doing the things that aren't auto graded, except for one or two maybe exceptions, will largely be graded by Jorge. And so I would encourage you to either email him first or email both of us. Because if you email me, I will need to check with him. So I'm just going to forward to him and, and get uh, you know sort of background info. And so um, so with that in mind, it's a little bit to streamline things. Is that if you have a question about graded work that wasn't auto graded? then um, email Jorge or email both of us. Um, if you have questions on this auto-graded, then that's probably my fault if something screwed up, so you can email me directly. All right.
questions about that? Okay. Um, so yeah, so office hours syllabus, so the course info thing. So if you're open that course policy is up here, this is sort of a sample of what you'll see. There's stuff about how do I use Canvas for different things. There's simulation resources. If you're interested in doing an honors contract in this course, there's the honors, honors contract information. So take a look at that um, before reaching out um, and so on. So all of that's kind of there. Oh, and then of uh, course textbook. There is a textbook associated with this course. If you want a hard copy, that's great, that's fine. But this textbook is available 100% for free from the library. And I've got an online link for that from our uh, ASU library. But I've also gone ahead, and I'm probably not supposed to do this, but downloaded uh, the PDF of it ahead of time and just made it available from here so that you don't have to go chapter by chapter to the library of those things. So if you don't want to buy the book, that's fine. It's all there. If you want a hard copy, that's great too. It's totally up to you. So the book is available there uh, on Canvas, on its contracts. Um, if uh, I just like to point this out, it's a lot of students, I think they'll know about it, but if um, how many people have used the what if phrase in Canvas? So a couple of you. Um, so a lot of times students, you know, if you're getting towards the end of the class, they're looking at the grades and they might be kind of curious about what sort of grades they might want to hit on certain assignments, or even they know that some assignments are dropped or whatever, maybe there's certain assignments they don't want to uh, turn in. If you go to the what um, to the grade book in Canvas, you can actually click on grades that haven't been submitted and submit a hypothetical grade and it will recalculate your grade as if you had scored that. So these what if grades are available there. And the weird thing about Canvas is instructors don't have access to that. So if you email me and say, um, hey, what, what do I need uh, to get on the final to get you know, an A minus or something like that? Um, it, the only way I have to do that is actually go in the grade book and give you fake grades. And I like to avoid that because it like pollutes all the grade history. But you have access to go in here and you can do that game yourself without even having to get me in the loop. So um, if you're never used that before, what more info of that will link to you. Um, and then, like I said, we use Vinson and Insight Maker. So if you're interested in downloading Vinson yourself, it works on both Mac and the Windows. Uh, there's a page there that tells you how to do that. Um, uh, Insight Maker um, is you just have to set up a free account on a website, and there's a page here that tells you how to do that. Um, I've also put together a lot of tutorial videos for both of these software packages that go beyond what we talked about in the class here. Um, one of them, I was sort of surprised, like some of the Vincent videos here got like 20,000 views from, since like I recorded them a couple of semesters ago. So uh, for whatever reason, they get a lot of attention on YouTube. And so um, the um, so if, if you're having trouble with Vincent or want to like, do something more advanced, um, take a look at those tutorials. Maybe they'll help. Well, of course, you can also just email me and ask. Um, so then this is what the readings look like. So um, readings here. So we'll see that uh, when there are certain lectures, like lecture A3, this is lecture A1. Tuesday will be A2. Thursday will be um, A3. And um, so before certain lectures, there's an expectation that you'll have done certain reading assignments. And so um, if you go into the readings here, uh, there'll be a link to the reading assignment directly. And we're using perusal. So how many people have used perusal in the class? A couple of certain more, okay. So perusal is really, um, and I've really enjoyed it since I've started using it in courses. So the chapters, I've, uh, you can download the chapters yourself as PDFs, but under these links, these read chapter links, they'll open it in perusal. And perusal is kind of a site where um, it will show you the PDF, and I have already submitted sort of comments that you can either read and kind of help highlight things that I think are important in the chapter, and you can comment on my comments, or you can submit your own comments, like, I found this really interesting, or I disagree with what they said here, and so on and so forth, or you can ask questions, like, I didn't quite get what they were saying here, and those questions, then I can try to go by and try to answer those, if not directly in perusal in class. And so before um, these lectures, these special lectures that correspond to readings, and there might be one, one every one and a half to two weeks, um, then you read through using perusal. And then I've got these two things, a reading exercise and a reading assessment. They correspond to each one of these chapter things. And the way these work is that the reading exercise is an untimed assignment. You can just keep up next to your reading. And it's just asking you questions to help you sort of focus on what points in the chapter that I think are kind of important 
So there, it's meant to be extrinsic motivation for you to sort of hit certain things in the chapter. And then once you've um, done all of that, then there's a reading assessment, which is a really short assignment due before class. So you can do it the night before. And it's time. It's usually 20 to 30 minutes at a time, maybe three or four questions. And um, in that case, it's meant to be sort of test your comprehension and retention. And so in theory, you can have the chapter open while you're doing it, but because it's time, it's a little harder to. Um, so once upon a time when I did these, um, when I taught this class, these would be paper-based assignments at the beginning of class. So it would take like 10 minutes, but, um, but then COVID happened and everything, and so everything got shifted online, and I just left them there online. So you can do them sort of at, uh, as you need. So those there's this kind of triplet of exercises that are associated with each one of these chapter readings. Um, the um, other thing that I want to point out is if you go into the units at the kind of the bottom of the module, at the top of every unit, there's an outline and a study guide. And so basically it shows everything that we've got to go over in the unit, as well as the learning objectives that I'm expecting you to get out of every unit. So if you're looking for a study guide, what, you know, I come out of unit A, what was I supposed to get out of this? Like, you know, I'm going to get a midterm coming up. What's the midterm going to test me over? Um, then the study guide, that will be, uh, that's the good place to go. It'll say like for unit A, these are the things you should have felt, felt comfortable with. For unit B, and so on and so forth. So um, at the top of every unit, you've got that. And then within the units, this is the ones where I've shown the kind of interdigitated again, everything together. So we've got the reading assignments, the lectures, the um, uh, auxiliary materials, videos, et cetera, um, sort of all built in sequentially um, inside each unit. So the way those are organized. All right, so any questions on um, where the assignments can be found? Yeah. So it's not for every class. No, not for so what it'll be is like, for example, today for interesting course, a little bit about modeling. Tuesday, we're going to talk about an introduction to simulation modeling. And then Thursday, um, by then you'll read chapter one of Morecroft, the textbook. And 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 so it's sort of like you're going to compare his notes and my notes together. So it's kind of like in every unit. Uh, we'll go through a couple of things ourselves, and then we'll see Moorcroft's take on it, and we'll compare and contrast. So not every lecture corresponds to a chapter, but you could say there are groups of lectures that complement individual chapters. Any other questions? All right. Okay. So, um, so I'll get to like the how things are break out in terms of percentage in the grade and all that in a second. But just basic syllabus stuff kind of explained roughly what we're trying to do here. Um, and the expected learning outcomes that come out of this, when you come out of this course, I'm hoping that you'll be able to look around the world around you, find a sustainability problem. And certain sustainability problems are not going to be, you know, well suited for simulation modeling, but some are. And so at the end of this course, it's the idea you're saying, hmm, that's an interesting problem. There's some dynamics there. My mental models aren't kind of enough for that. I'm going to need some computational help. And being able to identify those and then start putting those into a high level language like VinSim or Insight Maker. And then, um, and then actually generate a sim that is parameterized by data. So that's another thing that we're going to have to do here. It's like when you put these simulations in, um, you can't just make up parameters. You have to actually come up with parameters that correspond to real physical variables. So, how do we do that? That's another thing that we should be doing here. And then, when you actually then generate these data, interpreting the data, these data, um, and you know what they what do they mean about the hypotheses you came up with? And then finally, using these graphs and so on to communicate ideas to someone else. That's kind of the five big things that I'm hoping that you'll you'll have coming out of this course. Or that you should have if I do my job, that you should have come out of the course. So we basically divided it up into two big sections here before the midterm. It's basically an introduction to computational models, introduction to numerical simulation of dynamical systems. So um, in units A through D, we bubble up through sim modeling, the confluence diagrams, the actual dynamical system modeling. So we take a midterm over that stuff, and it's a two-stage exam. I'll explain what that means here in a second. And then well, in the, after the midterm, between the midterm and the final, then um, we basically do applications. And so you're not going to learn more 
hear a little bit more about modeling, but more about how to make models more complex or model real world systems. So there'll be a lot of kind of case studies for um, what are complex systems and have been modeled this way and what is what did the tools up here tell us about those systems now? So that's the rough structure here. Like I said, the basic uh, book here is available for free on Canvas as well as from the library. Um, Calc 211 or SOS 211, basically Calc 1 is kind of the big prereq, but you're not going to have to solve any differential equations in this class, just be able to recognize them. Um, and you can find the textbook online. Um, if you go into the units, every lecture that is associated with a chapter has been indicated. So like lecture F1, underneath it, it says read chapter eight before lecture F1. So not every lecture has a chapter associated with it, but there are a few, and those should pop up, and they'll pop up in your to-do list in Canvas as well. Uh, VinSim is the tool that um, sometime soon you should probably try downloading. It's also load on these computers, so if you want to work at home, recommend downloading or use Insight Maker. Um, Insight Maker and VinSim do basically exactly the same thing. So you, I will demo both of them in class and you can kind of decide which one you're more comfortable with. We all will occasionally, especially in these first uh, couple of units, um, use um, spreadsheet software to do a little bit of the modeling for us. So Excel, Google Sheets, these will all be fine. Um, the math one as well, and just a basic spreadsheet. So any questions about requirements. All right, so how is the grade um, cut up here? So um, so basically the, the, uh, the course is divided up, your grade is divided up into these um, attendance for 5%. And so um, I put this highlighted C syllabus for dropping policy. So we're gonna find is that, um, that there uh, are, these four groups of assignments here, you're, there's actually, and I don't, I don't put them on the slides of dropping policy because um, for a while I was kind of deciding, converging on how many are going to be dropped. But if you look on Canvas or on the syllabus, you can see that for all four of these categories, your lowest uh, certain number are going to be dropped. So, um, so this, you know, and if you just, you know, have you done? If there's five assignments and I drop one, and you've already been four and happy with the grade. You don't have to, I'm not going to judge you for not doing the other side. So you can feel free to take advantage of that drop policy. Um, so uh, so the, uh, I guess I'm going, to, I'm going to step through here. So this lecture attendance, the way this is going to work is occasionally I will get a slide that looks like this one. Um, and they'll have probably two, maybe three of these that will happen um, during class. And so if you're in class or if you're connected via ASU Sync, you can go to this URL or scan that QR code and it'll bring you to a Google, a Google form. It'll have like 10 lines on it. There'll be these answers and questions. And I will ask you a question that has to do with the lecture content. And, um, and then you'll leave that form up through the whole class. And if I ask you two questions, you'll do the first question on the first line, the second question on the second line at the end of class. When I say that's the end of them, you hit submit. Then that will go in and out. Um, if you're watching this asynchronously, you've got 24 hours to do that after I post the video. So even if you don't come to class, you can still get attendance credit uh, by just going through and finding those, uh, those simple questions. I don't grade them for correctness. I grade them for coherence and completion. So if I ask you, you know, how many days you have the, you know, the, the say there's a grade correct, or if you get a grade correction, um, if you answer seven, then that makes sense. If you answer black bear, then that doesn't make sense. You won't get the credit. So, um, so these are just mainly meant to see, um, you know, um, they help me see how everyone's res responding to the material by seeing what sort of answers we get back there. And then they allow you to earn some credit here. But again, there's a drop policy for these attendance exercises. So, you know, I think I, I drop your lowest five uh, throughout the whole semester or something like that. So, you know, there's going to be times that you can't make it. That's totally fine. You don't have to worry about that. So. Attendance, you can do it asynchronously, you can do it synchronously, you can do it while you're in class. They basically will be with two or three of these things per lecture that'll pop up kind of at random times. They'll ask a question, you fill it in, you submit only at the end of class. So any questions about that? And um, so then there's these muddiest point reflections. So at the end of every week, um, including this week, so due Sunday basically of every week, 
you um, go onto Canvas, and there will be one of these money points where you'll submit in a sentence or two each, like or even a phrase. You know, if these are really short assignments, I'll ask you a question in the uh, the Canvas assignment. What was the clearest to topic covered in the week? What was the least clear or muddiest topic covered in the week? And uh, what was the most interesting topic you'd like to learn more about? And you can answer in A for that if you know you all pop out and nothing really was something that you really got you really excited about. So really, if you count that as in A is free credit, then I'm really just looking for a couple words here and a couple words here. We do that every week just so I can see how people are doing. Uh, but sometimes I'm surprised at what these two things are, the clearest and the muddiest. So now if everything's super clear to you, a lot of instead of saying everything was totally clear to me, like nobody's point, what I actually want you to do is rank all of the things we went on through in that week. And even if it's clear to you, tell me the thing that is like the least clear. So the thing you had the hardest time with, even if you understand it, the thing that it took you the longest time to understand, that's what I want you to see. Okay, those are the muddiest points. I already explained the perusal exercises. Um, there's um, homework assignments. There will be a couple of homework assignments that allow us to practice our simulation modeling throughout the semester. Um, they're um, individual assignments, but we will start several of them in class. So, and while they're in class, uh, you will be able to work together on them, but I want everybody to submit their own uh, their own work. So it should reflect your understanding. So if I ask you to come up with something, then I want everybody to come up with something unique. But of course, while you're coming up with it, you can do that kind of as a group to sort of brainstorm those ideas. But you have to sort of claim something that's your own when you submit these assignments. And then these exams. When I mentioned this two stage exam, something that has anybody ever had a two stage exam? I think, that, yeah, uh, while in college or like back in high school. Yeah, so this is something I think more common in high school, but I've had good luck with it. So the idea here of the two-stage exam, and this is both for the midterm and the final, is we're going to burn two lecture days for these things, but you actually can still take them remotely too. But but the idea here is, is um, that your exam score is going to be split into two grades, 80% individual, 20% group. So what's going to happen is, let's say hypothetically, the midterm stage one is on Thursday. Well, what that's going to mean is you're going to have 75 minutes to do an exam on your own, the midterm, uh, with maybe a couple of sheets of uh, uh, scrap paper, or uh, well, scrap paper, as well as maybe some, some crib sheets, and it'll be totally on your own. And, um, and, and so I can permit people to take it remotely. I'm actually going to do this on Canvas. And so if you'd like to uh, take them on the computers in the, in the room here, that's fine, but I'm also going to give you a window. So like if the exam is technically on Thursday, I might open up Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You can start the exam any of those three days, but then once you start it, you'll get 75 minutes, or maybe I'll give you 90 minutes to deal with any technical issues to take stage one. So you get up through all of that. I don't give you your score. I don't give you any solutions. Um, and so then you have a gap, and then stage two, let's say, Stage one was on Thursday and stage two is on the following Tuesday. In this case, um, it's totally open book, open notes, and open class. So you can collaborate with each other. You can, I will, even though both of these you'll be able to take remotely, um, I will be in the class at the normal class period, free to proctor. And so I'm basically will sit there and you can come in and you can collaborate together um, in this classroom because you all have this on your schedule. Uh, or you can do it however you like. And this too, I'll give you maybe like a three day window instead of Tuesday, it might be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And there they will not be time. So you'll just have all of those days. To, it'll be the exact same test you took stage one. So you won't know what you got right or wrong, but you'll be able to discuss that with each other and possibly make changes. And then once all of that's submitted, then I'll release the scores and the answers, and you will get your midterm score will be 80% times your stage one score plus 20% times your stage two score. And that's what we do for both the midterm and the final. Any questions about that? Okay. And, um, and like I said, just to allow for uh, remote as well and a lot of flexibility, um, I'm gonna do these uh, using Canvas. And so um, these will be electronically uh, administered and graded. And then the final project. So this is a group project. 
uh, with some peer reviews. And so you're going to work in groups, you're going to identify some real world system, hopefully sustainability related, and you're going to build a system dynamics model to model that system. Um, so uh, this, you don't really have to worry about this until basically right after the midterm. So we're going to start worrying about it kind of mid semester. And there's a couple of smaller assignments that you'll get to sort of like propose what you're doing, tell me who's on your team, et cetera, that uh, will help kind of divide up some of these, these points here. But the idea here, and again, I'll give more details of this to get close to it, is that um, you're not going to present to the class. What you're going to do is upload a video of your presentation to Canvas and upload your report to Canvas. And then you're going to peer review in the last week of classes. You'll upload the video and the report on Wednesday, last week of class. And then every person peer reviews one video and one report. So overall, every uh, report will get about four people looking at it, every video about four people looking at it. And then my score to your reports and presentations will be a uh, the, well, an average of those plus my own effect. So um, you'll have the opportunity still, your work will still be viewed by other people, but um, as your work will still be viewed by others in the, in the class, but we're not gonna have to do the thing where we burn one or two lectures of people coming up here and presenting in front of class and everybody sees everybody else. And that helps us um, have time for the multiple statements. All right, so questions about the assignments and structure. All right, so I would normally do an attendance exercise here, but I've already kind of burned it up in the beginning here. Um, other things uh, in general, once the availability closes on Canvas, uh, then uh, there's no uh, late penalty or whatever. There's no late policy after that. You're not going to get the 40 availability window. But if you can get it in between the due date and the availability window, I usually put a gap there or a grace period, there's no penalty. Even though Canvas will mark it late, there's no penalty after that. So basically, I give you due dates to encourage you to get the work done by that time. But the availability window is sort of the real due date. And so as long as you get in before the availability window closes, as long as Canvas allows you to upload it, then for most assignments, it's fine. Um, see syllabus or other related policies. Uh, grade correction, I kind of mentioned hinted at this, um, just to prevent a mass of people asking for grade correction at the end of the semester. Once we've scored your assignment, you've got seven days um, to, uh, to check on it and, and see if there needs to be a correction. After that, um, I can't discuss grade correction because again, I don't want to set things up to where um, all, you know, you get 20 people would come and say, like, I need to check the six assignments or something like that. So I was trying to do it a week after that. And uh, copyright course material, um, don't, any of the stuff that I give you, don't upload it anywhere else, don't sell it. Um, even though your own notes are technically copyright you, it's a violation of ASU's integrity, academic integrity policy for you to sell your notes. So also don't do that. Um, I give you a bunch of past midterms, past final exams. Um, so there's a bunch of material already on Canvas that I think should be useful samples for, for building conceptual models of the exams for this semester. So hopefully you don't have to turn to these third party websites and so on. But if you do, um, which I shouldn't, um, definitely don't upload any of this stuff. Um, if something's marked as an individual assignment, again, you can work together, but what you submit needs to be unique and reflect your own understanding. Uh, so this is sort of standard stuff um, uh, for uh, this on the syllabus. Um, those who uh, need an accommodation for a disability, contact sales, and, um, and we'll work something out. No problem. Questions? Policy stuff? Okay, so let's at least get, um, end uh, with a little bit of flavor of intro to modeling so that we'll be ready to go with some momentum on Tuesday. So I've already kind of mentioned a bunch of this type of thing, but um, that these computer-based tools that we learn about in this course will help us rapidly experiment with dynamical systems uh, models. And so instead of having to build a bunch of math to try to solve it all, we sort of write the math out and the computer does the hard work for us. But then we have to ask them, what the heck is a model? So we have to really understand what are models in order to like know what to do with it. Now, 
these are fashion models, right? So, but why do we call them models? So, um, if these are models, what like what makes them models? Why why is it reasonable to use that word? Anybody have a thought? That's interesting. So that the comment there was other people look at them for fashion, what to wear, and so on. So that is one interpretation. It's a totally, a totally fantastic interpretation is that one way we interpret these fashion models is they show us an option for normative um, ways to, to choose clothing. So they are modeling what um, what a you know a well dressed person you know dresses. In. What's another way we can interpret them as fashion models? Yeah. They represent um, the Okay, yeah, so I like that. Those are some great comments and insights here. The sort of the suggestion here is that this is sort of, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, this is sort of an oversimplification of the fashion process. Um, they're, um, the, the, this, they're communicating something, but maybe they're not incorporating a lot of the real world issues that have to do with, you know, people's, you know, real, more realistic body sizes and shapes, people who don't, you know, he probably has more product in his hair than I have in a week. You know, like um, they're both for some reason tilted the same way. And so there's a bunch of weird things about here. Um, but what are the other things? Any other comments on why we might call these fashion models? Why we use the term model? The other thing I was kind of getting at here is um, all, for all the imperfections here, um, the, there is a claim that this is better than looking at this jacket on a hanger. So these are not only models of what you maybe should wear, but these are models of what it might look on you if you were to put it on. So if you saw this jacket in a magazine just laying out on a table, um, that is probably not as informative as the jacket actually on a pair of shoulders. Now, when you look at this particular model, you might be looking at other aspects of it, other degrees of freedom that have nothing to do with that jacket. And that's something that we have to be very careful about, is that there is a garbage in, garbage out um, property of models. And that the function of fashion models, at least initially, was to model the fashion, to say, um, you want to know what it looks like to wear a jacket like this? Well, you don't have the jacket, but I'll put it on somebody else who is a human, and maybe that human will end up being closer to what you look like than a hanger or a table. And um, but because there are these extra degrees of freedom, then um, then even though it might look good on this model, when you put it on you, you realize it just doesn't have to fit. So you know, otherwise, like my um, my my uh, biologist friends would refer to this as an animal model. So this is a laboratory mouse. Uh, so in this particular case, um, the example here is that it's that you could put this through uh, experiments. You could say, well, let's um, let's deprive it of sleep and see how well it solves problems. Uh, let's uh, there's might be a pharmaceutical trial. Uh, there might be a bunch of different things that you would subject to this uh, animal as a stand-in for the system you actually care about, which would be like a human system, for example. Now, this mouse is far from a human. It has a tail, for example. It's got a lot more fur than your average human, but it is still a mammal. It has a lot of the same vertebrate physiology as a human. So it's a lot better than an ant, for example. It's a lot better than a plant. Um, so the physiology is a lot closer, but we don't necessarily have confidence that the result we get with this model will definitely work on a human. But um, if it causes problems in this model, it gives us the hint that maybe it'll cause problems in the human model. So that's kind of an example there. Likewise, um, this is a sort of Bohr model of an atom. Um, 
Uh, so it kind of looks like a solar system. It turns out that later on, um, Bohr um, recognized that this model wasn't great at making really fine scale predictions. So he turned it into a more realistic kind of solar system model with these elliptic orbits of electrons around a nucleus. And that maybe got a little bit better. But then far later than that, you got things that you see in a, in a freshman chemistry course like molecular orbital bond theory, which is a totally different way of modeling uh, electrons around a nucleus. And then you've got the kind of nuclear physics of, um, of the standard model of what goes on inside the uh, nucleus. And that also involves an electron. And in all of these things, we see perspectives on an electron changing over time. But the key message here is that really electrons are not being claimed. We're not claiming electrons exist. We're just claiming that a mathematical model that has electrons in them is useful. And so there might be an enterprising young uh, physics graduate student a couple blocks down the, uh, the road from here who's coming up with a new model of how matter works at the finest scale that doesn't have electrons in it. And what she discovers that shows that it solves some problem with discrepancies between these models and reality, then it might be that children from that point on, uh, starting in primary school, stop learning about the electron. So it's like the electron ceases to exist in an instant. But really, we're not ever searching, we're not ever trying to build models to reflect reality. We're just trying to build models that help us uh, do useful things. And so, um, you know, I kind of run behind on time here. So. But the other sort of example of this is Newtonian gravity is very different than relativistic gravity. Um, Newton was totally wrong about gravity. And yet, um, Newtonian gravity you know, keeps planes in the air. Like the Newtonian physics, Newtonian mechanics are super useful. And it's really hard to use relativistic, relativistic dynamics for most of the engineering problems that we deal with out here on Earth. So it's not about being realistic, it's about being useful. And uh, so what I kind of want to get to here, so I'm just going to kind of like, I won't rehash some of this stuff um, next time, is that my definition of a model, the thing that I'm hoping that you'll take away here, is that models generically are anything that provides an answer to a what-if question. And so, um, and that could be a, a graph you draw on a wall, that could be a, a figure you make with your hands, that could be a verbal model, um, it could be something in your head, it, um, it doesn't have to be a piece of math, doesn't have to be a computer, it doesn't, it could be um, something you assemble, it could be a physical model, you can say this is a, a model of a volcano, and it could be something with baking soda or something like that, it has nothing to do with plate tectonics, but it helps you answer a certain what if question. So anything that helps you answer that is what we call a model. They're fashion models because they help me answer the question, what if I was to put that jacket? All right, so that's kind of the key point. Um, that I want to get to today. I don't want to keep you guys any longer after that whole disaster, which I'm going to try not to have happen on Tuesday. Um, moving forward, um, complete that unit zero activity by Sunday. Um, start reading chapter one. I'm going to fix all the due dates so that you won't have any trouble with that. And it's a good idea to maybe start looking into downloading VimSim or creating an account on Insight. Base. And that's all I've got for you today. So um, again, sorry for the, uh, the slow start. Have a good weekend. Try to stay dry.